we have uh, His Excellency Ruben Armando uh, Escalante Haspun. He's ambassador and deputy permanent representative of El Salvador to the United Nations. And he, before his current post, he was a minister counselor uh, in charge of human rights and social affairs uh, here. And he also held post at International Civil Society based in Tokyo, Japan, for seven years. And he earned his MA degree in international politics at uh, Aoyama University. Uh, first of all, I just would like to thank uh, both the Journalist Writers Foundation and the Peace Silence Institute for the invitation. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. No? Yes? Can I get closer to the mic? Okay. Well, I'm just going to stay like this. Um, uh, uh, we've been uh, invited to be part of this panel, I think, to bring a little bit of the, the national experiences and uh, the national lessons that we have through our own process and obviously to speak a little bit about the relationship that we have between what we call the three pillars of the UN and I'm going to be elaborating on that uh, right now. Uh, one of the things that I would like to start with is um, I remember yesterday we were having a, a lunch and briefing with Navi Pillay, she's the, the High Commissioner for Human Rights and we were talking about how one of the pillars, which is human rights, is getting less and less funds, even when it's one of the main pillars of the UN. You know, it's supposed to be peace and security, and development, and, and human rights. But at the end of the day, when you really analyze the situation, you come to the understanding that it's all been an artificially constructed notion. So we put peace and security on the one silo, that we put development on the other, and then you put human rights in the other, as if uh, they were not connected, where in reality you need the three of them to be at the same time in order for people and societies to prosper. So this kind of lack of understanding that somehow happened, uh, it's one of the main issues, both programmatically and financially for the UN right now, how to give priority when in reality all of the issues are supposed to be advancing at the same time, at the same level. And in a situation in which you have a certain amount of resources, and in which under this conception you need to make priorities, then you have all those little tags of war because some people want to see human rights first, other people want to see peace and security first, other people want to see development first, where in reality you need to be having a more comprehensive view of how the human being and how societies work. So this is the first kind of idea that I would like to throw in for us to make connections and for us to make the obvious connection between sustainable peace and sustainable development. And in my particular case, uh, it's not the, the only case where it's happened. You have, sadly enough, uh, a lot of cases of international civil war that you can study um, to actually withdraw the conclusions on how important it is to have sustainable peace in order to proceed to the stage of, of actually building the foundations of what can be called sustainable development. Uh, for, for those of you who don't really know much of, of Latin American history, we had our civil war from 1980 to 1992, but that was the actual conflict. All the triggers, all the structural causes were there for centuries. And I'm talking about the, the bad distribution of the land, the bad distribution of resources, the monopoly of power, the monopoly of um, the economic resources, the marginalization of a big chunk of the population. And then you throw all this together and then poof, together with a wave of uh, left thinking in which peasants were not supposed to be just there, but they were supposed to be also claiming their rights and a more a higher level of awareness, then that creates a very good recipe for social conflict. So we had this process from 1980 until 1992. At the end of the day, we had the UN coming in. And uh, we had something that was called ONUSAL, which is the, the peace building, let's say, a peacekeeping uh, operation for El Sabo that lasted, I think, for four years. I was 12. So one of the things that I remember the most is that when UNUSAL came in 1992, uh, there was like a sketching contest all throughout the country, and all the kids, we had to draw something about peace. And I made it to the third uh, prize, but the girl who made it to the first prize, I remember... The sketch was, uh, there were kids playing with soldiers, 
and all the weapons were laid down in the field. That was like she was like a seven year old, so you can imagine like the legal figures of the kids playing. Uh, it was something like a toboggan or a or a merry-go-round that they were playing it. And um, after this, we were officially in the peace building process. So after the peace building process, we started to through the implementation of the peace agreements, trying to, to have some sort of development. And the peace agreements, what they did, they tried to correct the wrongs of what had been the causes of the war. So one of the particular, and th this is something that I am, not an, I am not an academic, so I don't know if anybody can correct me here, but one of the, what of the, one of the things that you can see across a lot of conflicts is that there is no access to decision making. So the access to decision making is restricted to a particular group and the group that is not given access to resources or to decision making tries to do it first through legal means and with legal means to work they go for illegal means which include guerrilla warfare. So in our case the uh, guerrilla movement which did not have access to resources and to political participation before was granted that access and they turned into a political party. And after 20 years after the peace agreements, they were able to win the elections in 2009. And we just had elections last weekend, and we're gonna hope to go for a second round, but uh, they, in the first round, you can really see like the, the, the political party that was the guerrilla warfare is doing well, together with the other parties. So that part of the inclusion into the legal, into the formal political process has been achieved. Uh, the one thing that was really uh, criticized is how at the same time that we were trying to build something out of scratch after the peace agreements, uh, we had a massive wave of liberalization in terms of the economy. And this happened uh, uh, through the Bretton Woods institutions, especially the International Monetary Fund. and. You might have heard of the the really famous uh, programs of structural adjustment programs from from the IMF that were approved in in Latin America over and over again. So it's been already, uh, I think, agreed that that was not the right thing to do, especially after coming out of conflict, because you had all these people who had to be demobilized, all these people to, who needed to find jobs. At the same time, the government was asked to uh, let go of all the public owned companies, of cut back on a lot of spending. So the, the hiring power of the state at the same time diminished while the working force increased. And it was a politically charged increasing force, in, like the working force. It was a working force that was coming from being a soldier. So obviously you had expectations, otherwise there might be the risk of they going back into the mountains. So the state was not able to provide that. Uh, the private company tried to do that after all the buy-ups of all the companies, but to a certain extent. And at the same time, we have the massive return of all the migrants who had left the country as political refugees, especially here to the US and to Canada. So you have all this influx of people coming, and even though there was peace, the, the, the baseline for development was a little bit shaky because we had to let go of resources through privatizations. Uh, so it's already been proved that that had to do a lot with the kind of social unrest that we have right now. I'm, I'm sure that you've heard about the gangsters, Maras, so we call them, if you just Google up. Uh, it's basically the, the youth and the kids from the generation of the early 90s who are now 20 something. And uh, something went wrong with all these elements that actually created this this youth gangster Mara movement that is growing. So there you can see like one big connection about what needs to be sustainable peace and what needs to be sustainable development and how you need to tame to make sure that they go hand in hand, not just because you've signed the paper, it means that everything is gonna go beautiful beautifully from now on. You need to have the participation from all the constituencies from the very beginning to the very end. Now uh, one of the other things that I would like to share is I'm, I'm going to try to follow on the three 
uh, the four ideas that we have in this piece of paper to make sure that I don't really go too far away from what we're supposed to be talking about here. But um, within the UN system, um, now that we're having all these discussions and since this this panel is being done within the uh, the context of the Open Working Group, I think it's really essential to realize that peace is something that should not be put aside. And I had I had the honor to, to be participating in another of these events uh, last night about education, and then we came to a, to the conclusion that education, whatever shape the post 2015 development agenda takes, has to be there because education is the one thing that actually teaches you who you are and how you behave. And if it's in gender issues, if it's in environmental, aware, environmental awareness, if it's about how to, how to handle conflict at the family level, at the social level, at the world level, it's through education, that's going to be your primary source of teaching girls and boys how to do it well. So education, and I, I remember that you were mentioning education before, it's a fundamental pillar, and it's one of the glues that can stick the three pillars of the UN together. So development, peace and security, and human rights, when you have education, it's one of the things that connect the three of them together. Um, one of the other points that I wanted to make, and I'll try not to... How much, long do I, how much longer do I have? 30 seconds? No? Two, three minutes, okay. Oh, God. Um, yes. I'm trying to rearrange all my thoughts in my head because I was I was planning on speaking a little bit longer. Uh, within the different institutions that you have here at the UN, uh, I'm trying to make a little bit of the connections with what my situation in my country was. I don't know if you heard so, uh, about something called the Peace Building Commission. The Peace Building Commission is, I, I will say one of the the examples of how the UN is trying to couple with the reality of you cannot just pack and leave a country because the peace agreements have been signed. There needs to be a certain political accompaniment of the country even after that. Once the peacekeeping operation is done, it doesn't it doesn't mean that everything is going to be beautiful. There's always the possibility of a backslide into conflict, and that means that you're not going to be able to progress into the development stage. So the Peace Building Commission is trying to do that, is trying to put in the agenda countries that formally are not in conflict anymore, but still in this, are, in, are under the state of fragility. And it's a good exercise if you have a look into how it was composed. It was it's a composition that comes from the General Assembly, from the Security Council, from ECOSOC, from the troop contributing countries, and from the money contributing countries. So you have a lot of constituencies there. And it's, it's one of the things that stand in the middle between the mandate of the Security Council and the mandate of the General Assembly. Because the Security Council can see threats to international peace. Now, a country that has already go beyond the conflict stage, who formally should not be in the agenda of the Security Council, but could be in the future in case there's a backslide into conflict, needs some sort of accompaniment, specifically in this case coming also from all the, the different components of the General Assembly. So that's why there was like a merging of elements there and this came up. Now, Talking about, this is something that I would just like, would like to mention uh, based on the mechanisms and the follow-up mechanisms that we're supposed to be talking here and the enforcement mechanisms. But I think the enforcement mechanism that can work the best is the checks and balances that you have within a society and that's when civil society kicks in so strongly. Uh, because at the same time you have all discussions and when whenever you're going to be talking about peace and sustainable development. There's always going to have the issue of definitions. What is what is peace? The the NGO that I was working for that was mentioned when, when my intro introduction was made, Peace Boat, was really strong and is really strong on peace issues. But peace means so many things that the agenda is really large. It doesn't mean that you just don't have nuclear weapons. It doesn't mean that you just don't have a conflict. It can mean that the causes might be there. 
I mean, the level of exclusion, social exclusion, exclusion of minorities might be there. And sooner or later, you need to be paying attention to that in order to prevent a conflict in the future, in order to preserve whatever development gains you've done, so you've, you've, you've made so far. And one of the key issues that I think um, civil society is so key in, in fathering is the appropriate use of resources. And here, obviously, I'm talking about how much money is going to public health, how much money is going to education from the national budgets, and how much money is going into into the army and into you know like defense capacities that hopefully you're never going you're never supposed to use, like the nuclear weapons. You 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 can have them, but you're not supposed to use them. So this this rearrangement of whatever kind of public funding you have to prevent conflict instead of having the arms and the weapons to react to conflict. It's one of the things that need to come from whatever kind of national dialogue or whatever kind of national mechanisms happen to be in place. If you don't have those mechanisms in place, then it, uh, it's up to civil society and the, the, the people in power and the politicians to try to put those in place. And when you don't have those um, mechanisms for dialogue within the forces of a society, that's when you already start having all those elements that might become conflict in the future because of what I was telling you what, what, what I was telling you before the lack of participation in the political decision making process so uh, I think that will be my final kind of thought to you the issue of participation and how peace and development is not just made here at the UN here at the UN is the final stage of the chain because here's where the decision is made positions are being made back in the capitals so those positions are the ones that you can influence from your particular countries. Of course, you can try to influence the diplomats and the politicians here at the UN, but you also need to be targeting the source, which is how every society perceives peace and perceives resources that should be going to peace and to development. And the big appeal not to see these two things as separate things, they are just one thing that are called two different names. So that would be it. Thank you. I'm sorry if I actually ran over my time. Uh. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and uh, for sharing uh, your perspective and uh, uh, experience of the El Salvador in this uh, issue. And we hope that uh, as we f uh, further go uh, with the discussions of the SDGs and targets and goals and how to implement them, and hopefully the cases and the lessons will be learned from the uh, nation's experiences. And. Uh, Put uh, it will uh, the, all those experiences will be uh, considered uh, as we go further.